so like give it give us like a, a freestyle version of like who's mike andy's what is augusta lawn care and um like how did you get started and like what's your what what has been your like tiering because you say like yeah i got from like 200k 500k and this and like a million and then it's like but you explain like how you do different things like for each step of the way like maybe just talk about that for, for a couple of minutes yeah for sure so i got started basically like a lot of us really really young uh i started when i was 11 years old uh mowing lawns kind of saving up for college. So I started college when I was really young. I was 13 years old when I started college. Uh, I thought I was gonna become a doctor. So I wanna get a head start on that. So basically lawn care was what kind of paid my way through college from my undergrad degree. And then before going to medical school, I decided to basically cancel my applications and to, um, to start Augusta. So beforehand it was my brother and I, Andy's lawn care, my last name. And so I switched to, to Augusta Lawn Care and just really being able to scale it up while I was getting my MBA at night uh, from, from the local university. So uh, that was when I was 18 years old, I started. And then, like you said, kind of those first several years, like uh, in terms of revenue, like the first year was part-time, so I did like 28, 29,000 revenue. Uh, then I went full-time, next year went to 200. Year three was about 490. Uh, year, uh, year four was about 800 and it was like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.6 1 and a half. So um, that was kind of the progression in terms of like my role throughout that period. I feel like there's really four different stages that we as owners go through. And the first one's when you're out in the field, right? You're a labor, right? Like it's really, if you really boil down what your title, your position is, you're a labor. Uh, and, and then what happens as you begin to grow is you eventually become the point where you kind of become office manager. You're no longer necessarily working out in the field, but you're kind of managing the office. Like a lot of your day is spent on estimates, uh, emails, phone calls, hiring, training people, kind of like everything in the business still besides the labors, right? So like stage two is really office manager. Third stage is estimator. Uh, and so that's usually going to be when you are, you have hired someone for the office. So what kind of happens is as you grow, you kind of hire up the position you last leave. So if you leave the labor position, go into the office manager, you've now hired people in the labor category to kind of take care of that. Then to go from an office manager to kind of the estimator role where all you're doing is estimates mostly, you got to hire an office manager, right? So traditionally I see someone going from, you know, labor to office manager around when they have like four to five employees, maybe six employees, depending on your market, what services you offer. And then really going to where they have an office person, they've hired that out, and now they're an estimator full time. I usually see that starting to happen when someone has more like seven to 10 employees, they start becoming more or less a full time estimator. And then the fourth category is really, you know, kind of CEO, and that is you hire an estimator. And now your role really is to grow the business, focus on marketing, focus on branding, focus on uh, you know, hiring new talent to the team, but you're really not involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Like you can leave for a week or two and, you know, things still move and operate just fine. Jobs still get sold, jobs still get completed. So it's kind of like the four stages I kind of break it up into uh, and kind of like how I got started. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm doing that like right now. Um, I'm, I'm having trouble like getting off of like, because I passed the maintenance on to somebody and then I wanted to just start a project crew that does like cleanups, mulch, that kind of stuff. Um, but I'll say like, it has been like a little difficult in like January and February to like try to do that. Cause like, even though we'll have like full weeks of like work. Sometimes like there isn't a full week. And then, so like, I don't know, it's just difficult to juggle it. But I would say that's what I'm working on right now. Um, but yeah, what about um, landscape business course? What, well, I, or actually like, where, where do you get your, like all your business savviness because like you're pretty good at it and you're 24 or 25 
um, w did you learn all of this in college or like what class did you take to learn all of this stuff? <laughs> yeah, like I, I would say a small percentage of it, not very much honestly, was like from, you know, getting my math, you know, the MBA program, honestly. Um, I would say most of it was, you know, books and then obviously just learning and reading and just absorbing yourself in it. Like when I was just getting started, I was those first couple of years when I was in the field, like I said, that was when I was getting my MBA at night, right? So like what I would do is I'd, I'd be up early, I'd work usually from about, you know, sun, sun up for us, you know, as you know, it's not super duper early um, in the spring. So like maybe 7 a.m. I'd get started. I'd finish though around 5, 5.30, then I'd drive straight to school at 6. And I would go from six to 10 for lectures. And then after we have a uh, class, like class projects and study halls, stuff like that for the MBA program. Uh, so usually what would happen is like all day long while I'm working, I'm listening to audiobooks, podcasts, um, interviews, you know, business, business, business content. And then you go to school and you just, that's all you hear for the next four hours. And then after that, you're absorbed in it. So like, it was really two years of boot camp of just learning, um, you know, everything to do with business. And so that's probably what I attribute a lot of the initial uh, part to. And the fact of it is just like the, the curiosity and the, the love of that, you know, topic is something that, you know, the same way that some people look on the weekends at, you know, a fishing magazine, or they go golfing on the weekend. Like I look at stocks and I look at, you know, business journals and the wall street journal. Right. So like, that's what I love to do. And so the fact that someone um, would allow me to do that and get paid for it is pretty cool. The same way that some people would look at football or, or golf and say like, man, I love that. And I wish I get paid for it. That's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I feel like uh, when you get to like a certain point, you're, it's like super fun, but like, before that you're like in the trenches it feels like <laughs> yeah and I think I think it's almost a wrong mentality to always think that too much because it becomes very much of a horse you know a carrot in front of the horse like oh man like when I get bigger it's gonna be easier like in a way yes like financially is it easier for me now than when that first couple of years like yeah 100 percent um you know stress and pressure of like the business just being able to survive is that no longer there as much like true yes but does that mean that like less stress or like, like the problems I have now on a daily basis would have been like big issues my first year or two, right? Like they would have put me out of business, but now they happen every day, right? So, you know, to think that like, oh, like if you get big, it's going to become so much fun, so much more fun is not necessarily like, I really think that like look at every day and every stage of the business and what can you get from a positive angle? Like, what can you get out of this? Like, um, whether it be, if you're in the field, like you're going to get in really good shape. You can learn a lot by listening. You don't have a ton of people and phone calls and emails. And like, you're not tied to just trying to help other people because you can really lock in on your, your own skill set. And so, uh, as you become a manager, as you become a, an owner with more and more employees, you don't get that, that, uh, uh, kind of like alone time in the truck anymore you don't get the day where you just grind for 10 hours mowing a lawn back and forth like that doesn't happen so like I think you got to cherish the good parts of every stage of growth knowing that each and every one's going to have their pros and their cons but to think that like the next stage is going to be like so much better and unlock happiness for you in my mind just like a very very um poison like like very very dangerous to, to think that way right so what what are like, what are the problems that you have, like, at your stage that you're at right now? And you're at, like, the CEO stage. So, like, what, what comes along with that? Well, like, now that we have franchisees, you know, my, my biggest headaches or, like, um, stresses, like, as you said, like, it's not like it was the first year, right? The first year it was I broke someone's window and, like, that would, like, ruin my week, Right. Um, or a customer wouldn't pay me and that would ruin my like, you know, a couple of days of my you know, life. And so whereas now it's like, it's bigger issues, right? Like you're dealing with franchisees that are divorcing, going through a divorce. You're dealing with people that are going like business owners that you're now responsible for that are having a mental breakdown. Like those are bigger pressures than broken glass and a hundred dollar unpaid invoice. Right. 
And so right. it's not to say though, or diminish the amount of stress of the, the broken glass, because at the time that could have put me out of business or that could have really damaged my reputation locally. So it's not to say that anyone's greater or more, just different stages, right? And so to compare them in my mind is, is very, very um, amateur because to compare what I'm going through now is not to say, to compare it against the broken glass is not to say like I'm having bigger issues now. No, because like I don't have the financial pressure of knowing that if I broke glass, that it could put my business, put me out of business, right? So there's different stresses. And I think now for me now, it's more about other people and me knowing the stress that they're going through growing this first year or two of business is very difficult to have that responsibility of them putting that trust in you to, to know that like they're investing in Augusta to make sure that they are successful and that I like, I want them to do, be that way. And so when they hit, when they hit issues and struggles, that's when it really affects me a lot. So how many uh, franchises do you have now? Uh, we have 37 locations now, F five of those are corporately owned. So we own them. Like I own those ones uh, myself. And th those are like, you know, one in New York, one in Nor North Carolina, and then the three in uh, Washington state. Oh, nice. So where are you guys in Washington state? Uh, we're in Bellingham, Mount Vernon, and then just recently in Redmond. Oh, you're Redmond now? Yeah, we just started one there. Redmond, Kirkland area. Nice. Don't worry. We're not coming. We're not coming down to Bothell. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, dude, there's so many lawns to mow. Like oh, yeah. there's, there's plenty of lawns for Augusta to come over here and mow too, but just be careful. <laughs> Just be careful because uh, we have a real quality service, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like, like explain how that goes, like starting, because like you don't live in Redmond and like, like how do you, how do you start a lawn business in Redmond without being in Redmond, not knowing people from Redmond and you're in your office in Bellingham, like, yeah, well, it's really crazy. It's not that, like so at the same tokens, like they start in February, but in this month, we're also starting one in New York and one in North Carolina. And so both of those places, like, you know, I'm not there. Uh, all three of the people that are starting those as general managers, they are, uh, you know, I don't know them personally in terms of prior to them working for us uh, and or friends or family or anything like that. And two of them, oh, wait, one. Yeah, two of them I had never met before, literally, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, right? And so th that's really when systems become so important, right? Like relying on the systems that the business has built and knowing that regardless of the person that is in charge, like obviously the general manager needs to be competent and like have skills and all the rest of it. But it's not exclusively only going to work if Michael Andes is there, right? That'd be very problematic. And so I think a lot of times we build our business around our personality uh, and that's why simplification and systematization is so important. So that way I can plug a general manager into anywhere in the United States, in my opinion, and the systems will work. Uh, it's about using those systems. And then just as long as there's a good executor, if someone that can execute on those systems, it should work just fine. Gotcha. So like, like for me, I would be like, kind of scared to or like like they have your name on their shirt on their truck and everything so like does that kind of like freak you out at all or like it's probably not because it's so normal to you but like and you probably wouldn't allow someone to have a franchise if they weren't like a straight up dude but like do these guys get interviewed or did they work for your location in Bellingham and then you're like hey you're a really good worker would you be interested in starting a, another route over in Redmond so for the general managers that know they've never worked for us they basically I made a video in uh in, I think it was December or January basically asking people to apply you got a whole bunch of applications and then I weeded through them on zoom basically right uh in terms of interviewing them uh, those for the general managers, for the franchisees, not almost, no, almost, I think all of them, actually, I haven't met them be until they come for training. And so it's been 
through Zoom calls like this that we're getting to know each other. We are making sure that something that's going to be a good fit for them and get them to their their uh, goals in terms of joining Augusta. So it's a it's built on trust. It's built on they have to trust us at the corporate level that we're not going to just take their money and run. Uh, and then then we have to trust them, like you said, that they're going to be a good representation of the brand and what we're trying to do here at Augusta. And so there's definitely trust that has to be built both ways. And that's really part of what we believe is in our culture here is whether it be for the franchisee, the franchisor, to, but then also the, the franchisee or the owner, the employer to the actual frontline employees on systems like pay for performance and profit sharing, where it's vital to have that trusting relationship. Yeah. So like, tell us a little bit about your, because you talk about systems, like what, what are some of your systems? Because like, it's important to have like your Augusta culture on like all of your trucks and like, is wouldn't look good if like everybody was smoking a cigarette and like throwing it on the lawn or whatever. So like being like bigger, like how do you keep that? Like, like good, the good guys. And I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like the, the, the goal is to have it where the system polices the the behavior of the employee instead of you, because like you can only manage so many people, right? And traditionally, you can only usually manage six to eight people very, very well that are directly reporting to you. And so that's a lot of times why people have to get a middle manager when they cross about 10 employees. Um, however, uh, the, the, the fear, the fear of being misrepresented because you have all these trucks and trailers out there, you got people running around the country, like using your name and your brand. Like that is definitely a, a thought process of like, oh man, I don't know, like I can't control it. But honestly, that comes from a very much of a, a fear and a small mindset, right? Like, because like, if you think about Amazon, like they have thousands and hundreds of thousands of vehicles running every single day. They have employees running, people with the, the name all over them. And there's going to be mistakes and you have to come, you know, come to peace with the fact that if you're going to grow and you're going to grow your business and you're going to hire people, like not only are you going to make mistakes, but your employees are going to make mistakes and they're going to make you look bad occasionally. They make the brand look bad occasionally. Um, but you have to look at the aggregate whole of scaling up. Like Amazon has done a lot of good for the country and, and good for the world in terms of lowering shipping costs and lowering, you know, a lot of things. Obviously there's people out there would say they did the opposite. Right. But, um, overall they serve the consumer the customer the most and right. uh so in, in my mind you got to look at it kind of like an aggregate whole like i believe we when we go into market we do bring up the level of professionalism of the competition they now uh are expected to get their estimates to their customers within 24 hours because we do they're expected to be able to have professional uniform crew good looking truck because we do uh, they are expected to have a great website, have cards on file, answer their phone calls, get estimates back fast. Like all of those things are things that we create. And then when we move into us into a, a community, our goal is to raise the level of professionalism in the landscaping industry. And we do that you know, location by location. Gotcha. Okay. Um, what else? What else would you like to share, Mike? Yeah, like I think the big thing is, you know, especially for your, your audience that you know, might be getting started is like, don't look at like two, two people you shouldn't look at, right? You shouldn't look at me and you shouldn't look at someone on like a YouTube channel. Like I'm just gonna name people off and I'm, well, I don't mean to be detrimental to them because I just said myself. So like, let me explain, just give me a second. But when I say YouTubers, I'm talking like Brian's Lawn Care Maintenance, you know, Keith Calfis, Tigran, all those guys, right? So first off, why wouldn't you want to compare yourself to someone like me? Um, you don't want to compare yourself to someone like me and, and judge yourself based upon what I'm doing because you're my, you might be in year number one or two, right? And I've been doing this for a long time and Augusta's now eight, seven, eight years, almost eight years old now, right? So don't judge yourself on what, you know, you're saying, oh man, I'm not, I'm not like as far down the road. Well, yeah, you just started the race. I've been running this race for 26 miles. I'm almost at the finish line on this marathon, right? So like you can't compare yourself to, to people who are just, have just been in the game longer. And then you can't compare yourself to people that are just on social media and have a lot of the outward appearances of what makes a good business when really good equipment, 
lots of views and followers does not make a good lawn care business, right? So to follow or emulate someone that has all of those things on social media is to basically say, I want to have what they have. Well, if that's what you want, that means you want a good YouTube channel, a lot of followers and views. It's not a good lawn care business, right? right. And so to take their advice um, and say, hey, I got to get this certain type of truck and like, I got to always get the newest thing. We got to realize the reason they do that is because that gets views. It's not what makes their lawn care business good. And then the, to look at someone like myself who buys three or four trucks in a given you know, sitting uh, in a day or two and make a video about it, you can't compare yourself against that because I've been in the game for a long time. So when you're first getting started, do not judge yourself based upon other people's successes, failures, or anything like that. Just put your head down, learn, and then just do your very best. And so that, that would be the biggest takeaway for someone just getting started, I would say. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I, I would think like pretty much everybody that gets started in lawn care, the the started watching like Brian's Lawn Maintenance or something is in the same boat. And like, I was one of them. Like, and it, it's saying like nothing bad about those guys or anything, but like, because they they have their own business and it's youtube so like uh i i'm not making podcasts to be a million dollar podcaster like it's honestly just kind of a hobby just like my instagram and like hey, you never know joe rogan got a hundred million dollars to go to spotify Really? <laughs> yeah his podcast you got a hundred million dollars to just hey that's just pretty nice <laughs> oh like only on spotify yeah his his long form podcasts are now only on spotify he puts little clips on youtube but no longer is like a full version of it on there why because of like what's going on in the country or what no, no, they paid him out. They paid him $100 million to basically exclusively stream on their their platform. That's nice. <laughs> Maybe I'll be uh, you someday with Landscape Business Card. <laughs> I doubt it. Oh, man. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you got to get going here soon. I don't want to, it's a Friday night. You got to go do stuff. Well, first, uh, like, what do you do on a Friday night, Mike? Because like, we all see you as like Mike Andy's. You're probably gonna go like research grass or something. But, <laughs> what do you What do you do? Just like because like all of these guys like I've met like Brian, like a bunch bunch of people uh, that are like big on Instagram or something, and like some people even like talk to me like that because I have like 7,000 almost 7,000 followers but really like I'm just a, a guy like that has some lawnmowers and like I like to ski and I like to goof around so like tell tell us like a little bit about you Mike what do you do on Fridays or whatever the heck yeah like you know I am I am um blessed in the fact that like I enjoy it right so for some people they mow grass and they or they do business and they do it as a ways to means that is to provide for their family or is to um you know pay for school or you know whatever it might be um I really love it though right so like even if I wasn't getting paid for it like my hobby would be business right and and trying to make money and like that that would be what I would do for fun and so when I, you know, have downtime, if I'm not with family or, or loved ones, like that's, that's probably what I'm doing. Right. And so, to, but again, for someone to say like, oh, I have to be that way. That's wrong. Um, and, and I don't feel like you even have to be that way to be successful in business. You just got to follow, follow, find your niche. Right. And so for me, like, yeah, that's, that's probably what I would be doing <laughs> um, in terms of just like you know, looking at the business, trying to make it improve it. Um, and especially on like weekends for me, that's my time to kind of lock in simply because the employees aren't there uh, working actively and the franchisees aren't as active. So I get less questions from them. Um, so it's kind of my time, to like, even if I am working out or like chilling out, it's like my time to think about other stuff and think about like creative ways of, you know, coming up with solutions or systems and things like that. So it's a lot of times the, the weekend is my time to 
uh, step back from the business from operating it, like, you know, texting and emails and phone calls and Zoom calls and all the rest of it and recording and all that sort of thing. And, and kind of step back and start thinking about like, okay, how can I improve it? Like, you know, I had a great week and we got a lot done, but what could I have done to make it more efficient? What could we have done to make it better for the team? What could we have done better for the franchisees? And so it's kind of my time to get creative, uh, which again, for me, that's what I enjoy, right? Like if I had, if I had a, a choice between playing golf, which I used to love to do, like love to play golf, every single day I'd play golf. That's why it's called Augusta Lawn Care. It's named after Augusta, right? So I love playing golf, but like now if you gave me a decision, uh, to you know, play golf for a round of 18 holes for six hours on a Saturday versus just literally look at you know stocks or look at uh, different analytics inside of our CRM for our franchisees. Like I would choose the latter um, because I would enjoy it, right? So it just it just ebbs and flows of life. Like you know, I'm sure maybe in 20 years I'll, I'll I might look at it a little bit differently, right? But I think being okay with your perspective and where you're at in life and what makes you tick is good and not judging yourself too hard like I didn't judge myself when I played 16 hours of golf a day now I would probably would but like I also don't judge myself now when I love to work and I enjoy it right and so I think it's very important before you know from a mental health standpoint that we first uh, accept ourselves uh, and are okay with what we want in life and what makes us tick and what makes us happy and being okay with that and then then going from there, knowing that life changes and stuff happens, right? And that it's okay to change. It's okay to have a week where you work 100 hours and the next week, you're like, you know what, I need some time and work in 20, right? So I think that there's no right or wrong uh, answer really when it comes to that. For sure. Um, um, so like, what what's your plan for, what do you want Augusta to look like in, 10 years or like what what's your end goal is it is it like to sell your company for like 10 million or like what definitely not to sell um i, I always want at least majority ownership stake in augusta um i'd say in 10 years there's definitely going to be another chapter on top of augusta for me in terms of business um that's probably more impact driven than just money but definitely for augusta um, in 10 years, I would want to be able to have like very pointed list of people that I, I had a part in making them a millionaire. That'd be a big thing for me. Just like knowing that I helped them start their business. And I know from starting this, how hard it is and how much pain and mental energy and physical energy and money and stress and, uh, risk that goes into it. And so for me to be able to kind of guide someone through that and get them to the other side. Uh, is extremely rewarding. That's what I do, you know, what I do every single day and why I keep waking up. And so um, in 10 years, I definitely want to have a very good list of people that I can look back. Like I was at least a part of that journey for them and helping them get through that. And that's why, you know, the podcast originally started not Landscape Business Course and Business Bootcamp is really just try to help other, you know, people starting out like that to know that like, you know, right now, even people looking at me now, like, like, oh, you got 37 locations. No, 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 like go back like three years of the podcast and you can see I was working like I was dark as all get out because I was either running estimates or running out in the field doing stuff all the time, right? So like um, I want to be able to have that chronological kind of story of the podcast and the videos I make. So that way in 10 years, like you said, in 10 years, when I have that list, it's not like, oh, like it's just assumed that he was always that way. Like there's, there's a lot of hardship that goes into it. And I want that to be evident to people. And that's why I try to be as honest and transparent as possible, because it's not always easy and it's not always fun and games. And it, it, there's times you cry. There's times that you doubt yourself. There's times that you are afraid. Um, and everyone has that. It's very normal. And so for someone to judge themselves and say that, oh, well, I'm not so-and-so online who's always happy and has it all together, in my mind, is very, very detrimental and uh, risky uh, in, in terms of society. And so I, I think in 10 years, I want to have a, a, a much, much, more, much more of an impact when it comes to small business owners, their mental space, and their confidence level as they begin to grow their business. And I would like to say one day that the same way that someone thinks about kind of personal finance, they think of Dave Ramsey. I would love for if, if I could be 
someone that could be synonymous with trying to help small business owners get started when they need help um, and kind of someone they can lean to. Yeah. Hey, I'll be on your list of. Um, <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, that's a really good mission to have for sure. Um, that's kind of, I don't know if I'll help someone become a millionaire, but by getting like boss landscapers and lawn care guys on my podcast and with people plugging this into their ears like instead of two chains or something like that like <laughs> maybe help them like get from like 10 lawns to 30 lawns or something just on a, like a smaller scale and uh, I mean like not to talk myself down or anything but like I don't have an MBA and like I'm not like wasn't the smartest person in my class and all this stuff but you know like I do I do know how to work hard and I do know how to like find a goal and go out and get that goal and like not quit and not listen to people that try to tell you different. So I think, yeah, like, and I think it's, I think it's really important. Like, I know it's super cliche to say, but like, you know how people say like, you know, stop trying to change the world, just change the world for one person. Right. And so I think like what you said there is important because you know, you do not need to be the next Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk to try to change the world or change the business landscape, but you can, you can be more impactful than them combined to one or two people, right? And so that's helping a small business owner locally that's struggling, uh, whether it be financially, whether it be through advice, whether it be through guidance or support, like whatever that is, you can be more impactful than maybe just a handful of people, right? And I think if we all, if we all did that, we'd probably be in a slightly better place, right? And so um, that's kind of the, the, Thing I would say. Awesome. Well, I know you probably got to get going here soon, Mike. Um, but uh, I want to say thanks for being or for doing a, a interview or uh, what do we, what do we call this? A Zoom call? And like, um, like, do you do this all the time? Like, because I saw you had like a bunch of slots for Zooms, and I'm like dude, does this guy Zoom half the day every day? I was like, how did <laughs> you much. <do> job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of, of Zooms and calls. So that, that's, that's my sweet. job description now. <laughs> that, that's so sweet because like other people charge to do like what you're doing right now. And like, I've been like, all these people are like charging for like all this stuff. And like, I, I get it. it Cause don't you charge for like landscape business course and stuff? Yep. Yeah. But like people are charging to do a video just like this and like, I, I get it, but I'm like, <laughs> where's like, where's the free help, man? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, absolutely. My pleasure, man. Yeah. I just think it's super cool. And, um, like if you would be down, I, I would be down to come down and just kind of like look at your spot and I don't know, like see what Augusta Lawn Care is all about. Um, I would, it's, you're kind of like, for like a local person, it's kind of like uh, the perfect cut of like Bothell or, or like Bellingham or something like that. But like, it would be cool to come down and like, see what you guys are all about and maybe like walk around and meet some of your guys sometime. I don't know. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Stay in touch with me. Yeah, we should do that. Um, but yeah, is there any other advice that you would have for me or any young bucks trying to be millionaires? Yeah, I think, I think honestly, like I know, I know I, I talk about making money a lot and things like that, but honestly, I think it's it's so secondary to being content. And if you need a million dollars to do that, then by all means, you should work day and night to get there. Um, but if you're content wow. at 250, if you're content at 100, then you should stay there, right? And so when you when someone there's a difference between contentment and complacency. I'm very much against complacency, but I'm 110 percent all in on contentment. And so for someone to say, oh, like, what do I need to get to a million dollars? It's like, well, first of all, do you need it? Because is it going to actually make your life any better? Everyone always thinks it is, but is it? Yeah. Um, because if you're content at 250, I'd stay there because a whole lot less stress, right? 
Um, so that's something to think about. And that's why even when we talked about before the show is like, when you asked about how to get go from 250 to three to a million, I asked, well, do you want to? Because you could take that same business, make it 350,000 by just raising your prices, increasing your margin, having really good employees that you pay a higher price for that you know they're, they're not gonna leave. You can really trust them. Uh, that's, a, that's a different lifestyle than running a million dollar company that you have turnover and lots of different leads and you got estimated and you're hiring an overhead and an office space and trucks all over the place. So I don't think that making a million dollars has any makes anyone any better. Um, but if someone needs that to be content or they have goals or aspirations to do so, and that's going to make them feel accomplished or that's going to get them to a place financially where they can do something in their community or with their family, whatever it might be, then by all means, like it's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and, um, you know, stress, but it is absolutely worth it when you get there. For sure. Yeah. I was, well, um, I'm friends with uh, like the owner of Synthetic Turf Northwest, and yep. uh, he said that Mike? you. Yep, Mike. So I was like, Mike, because I went in there, I want to do a turf job, and I was like, Hey, let me get some samples of turf, and then he was like, Oh, okay, and then I was like, Mike, like, would you want to um, make a podcast and maybe like talk about scaling a uh, business? Because they have just like a couple trucks a few years ago. And now they have like six trucks or seven, I don't know. And they're like selling turf and selling muck trucks and all this stuff. So like, he was like, well, you know, you should really just talk to Mike Andy's. <laughs> Mike, send me Mike Andy's cell phone number. <laughs> and then you know, like, I didn't get it. So I just, I DM'd you and then you were like, yep. And I was like, whoa, he answered my message. <laughs> So, oh, man. well, I got to bounce here for 530, but I appreciate yeah. it, brother. We'll stay in touch. Thank you, Mike. See ya. Take care. Have a good Bye. one.